I think it is our responsibility, particularly as developers of AI, as people who shape how AI is being uh, created in the world to say, what are our values and how are we valuing what is human? Welcome to Ask More of AI, the podcast looking at the intersection of AI and business. I'm Clara Shai, CEO of Salesforce AI, and I'm thrilled today to be here with Dr. Joy Bulamwini. Dr. Bulamwini is the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, which is focused on addressing concerns of facial recognition and biometrics being used in policing, education, and healthcare. She's also author of a new book, Unmasking AI, that comes out today. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Bulamwini, and congrats on your new book today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Well, I mean, this is such a top of mind topic right now is addressing bias in AI. And you have become one of the, the foremost leaders and also practitioners in doing something about it. And I'm just so curious, how did you come to be doing what you're doing? Yes. So I am, in addition to being an AI researcher, also an artist. And when I was a graduate student at MIT, I was working on an art installation that involved a mirror that would track my face and then put on a digital kind of filter. So imagine a video filter, but instead of it going through a video feed, it goes through a reflection of your face in a mirror. So I was having fun exploring this. And I got the first part to work and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if this digital filter in the mirror could follow my face when it moved around? So I got a webcam to make that work. I downloaded some face tracking software and this is where the story took a bit of a turn because instead of detecting my face as was, I literally put on a white mask and that white mask was detected more easily than my dark skinned human face. And so I started asking questions. Was it, you know, yeah. laws of physics, lighting conditions, right. what was going on? And that's what led me to what became my MIT master's a thesis looking at how different AI systems read various faces and asking questions like, does the skin type matter? Does the gender matter? What about the intersection? So that's how I came down this path. I was working on an art project and ran into some bugs that showed more than just a small glitch in one system. How amazing. I mean, just that personal experience. First of all, I'm sorry you had to go through that. But then how you've really, it's inspired so much of this amazing work that you've done since then, not just to, to call it out, but to do something about it. So tell us about the Algorithmic Justice League. Oh, yes. So after having that experience of coding in a white mask, being in white face at the epicenter of innovation at MIT, I wanted to create an organization that looked at AI biases and harms and raise public awareness. Because at that time, when I was having those experiences in 2016, if I even mentioned AI bias, people would kind of look at me like, oh, okay, sure, yeah. You're ahead you of your time. Math <laughs> is biased, <laughs> you know? But I thought it was important to have an organization actually amplifying uh, these issues, doing projects like when we partnered on the film Coded Bias, that people can see people's real lived um, experiences. We also were pretty early in this now growing field of algorithmic auditing, what it looks like to check AI systems for different types of biases, risk, and harms. And so that was another element of the Algorithmic uh, Justice League. And then we are very much about naming and changing, not naming and shaming. And so doing the research and calling out companies, we were then able to demonstrate different changes to policy, to products uh, that have even had an impact to this day. And then we went even further still than what I thought I would be doing as a graduate student at that time with opportunities to uh, testify in front of Congress or even, you know, more recently to be on an AI round table uh, advising uh, President uh, Biden. And so those were not pathways I envisioned when I started out studying computer science and being enamored by robotics. That is so inspirational. Um, so, of course, this has become even more pronounced and more important in this age of generative AI that has just we've just been launched into over the last 12 months. You know, what are the specific actions, you know, beyond the ones that you just described that you think that every company and regulator should be thinking about now? 
I always think about agency and choice. And so that comes throughout the entire AI life cycle. So oftentimes when we're creating generative AI systems, just like other AI systems that might be predictive, many of these systems are trained on data. But how that data is collected, at least when I was learning computer science, it wasn't a notion of you go ask for consent. If the data was available, it was available. And so even part of the process of writing Unmasking AI, as I was going through it, I was learning all of these ways I didn't even think about the societal impact of what I was doing. It was just, can this be done? Or I need a data set, right? And so lots of data scraping, et cetera, things that I'm not sure would be completely legal everywhere in the world. And so I think it's really important to think about data provenance and so also think about permission for accessing data, consent for that data, compensation uh, for that data as well. Another area that I don't hear discussed as much and in part, I think it's because of the goodwill of wanting to build systems that aren't biased, that are as fair as possible, that are inclusive as possible, is this notion of redress. And so even if we have our best intentions, what happens if something goes wrong, right? Let's say you did everything to inspect the tires, but you still got a flat on the road. There has to be some form of redress. And so that's another element uh, that I do think should be part of an ethical AI pipeline and also people who are thinking about what it means to build responsible and beneficial AI systems. So if we mess up, we have a plan in place for what we do for those who have experienced harms. Yeah. And and what what, what should we do when there are harms? What What kind of redress? What would that look like? I think one part that is the most straightforward to do, but oftentimes doesn't even happen, is acknowledging the harm in the first place. I'll give one example. So as you know, a lot of my work has been around facial analysis uh, systems and testing those systems. This year, there was a report that Portia Woodruff was falsely arrested due to a facial recognition match and actually put in a holding cell for a crime she did not commit. Mm. This is already terrible. Yes. To make matters worse, she was eight months pregnant. Oh, my gosh. And she reported having contractions while she was in the holding cell. And when they finally let her out, right, she had to be rushed to the emergency room. So now there are two lives at risk. Just looking at the context in general, right, someone eight months pregnant probably isn't carjacking. I'm going to put that out there, right? And so in this case, uh, she is now... Uh, suing the uh, law enforcement agency. And this isn't the first time the same agency has led to a false arrest. In 2020, Robert Williams was arrested in front of his uh, two young daughters. And so I think even just acknowledging some of these harms is a starting place. There are things like AI incident uh, reporting databases uh, that can be put in place. Now, what the redress looks like really depends on the type of harm, the severity of the harm, whether that is actually bringing in some type of monetary compensation or looking to see if what was withheld, if it comes to opportunities, can be given. So it truly depends on the context. But I think what everybody can do at a minimum is acknowledge the harms that have been done. Yeah. And you're doing such a great job in helping drive the education and awareness of that. Uh, now, when it comes to re facial recognition, it sounds like from a lot of the work that you, you've shared so far, it's because of these unrepresentative data training sets that are used to train the AI. Uh, but these days, with large language models, they're just scooping up everything that's on the internet. You know, we talked about this earlier. And unfortunately, it's not just the, the lack of representative data, but there's actually maliciously hateful information. There's hate speech on the internet. And um, where it's it's not uh, it's actually intentional. How should we think about that and safeguard around bias of that resort of that of that nature? Oh, that's a great question, right? So if you're training on the internet, you're gonna get the good, the bad, and the ugly, and there is a lot of ugly, as we know, 
online, I do think it goes back to data provenance. And so one of the challenges when you have such large data sets is knowing what's even in those data sets in the first place. And so one of the approaches is actually having smaller models where you can actually trace right the data provenance so you have a better sense of what's gone into these systems. Another approach that people have to be careful about is, okay, we'll scrape everything anyways, but we will have toxicity filters or we will have content moderators go through and look at the really ugly stuff. And then what we learn at times are the people who are doing that work themselves are facing harms, right? Because some of those images and some of that content itself can be trauma inducing. So even thinking about what it means to address algorithmic uh, trauma and also what does uh, fair compensation look like? What would fair trade data look like, right? What would an ethical AI pipeline look like? And also thinking about the climate impact, what would green AI look like? So we can uh, be excited about the innovations that are coming out without thinking, oh, it's built on a foundation that has harmed so many people to get benefits that help not as many. You know, as we think about the new risks that that come with generative AI versus classical AI, are there are there certain areas that that are are new that are that you're spending time on or are there things that that may have served us in the past that we need to unlearn for this new era of of transformers and large language models? Oh, that's such a great question. I've been thinking quite a bit about what does it look like to live in a world where you can't quite believe what you see. Yeah, or like hear. this could be made up, and you could just be you could be an avatar. Well, my hair is a little bit harder for AI systems, so I think well, I but would you're going to fix that little, problem. A, a few, a few tells, a few tells, right? <laughs> but I have been thinking uh, quite a bit about constrained infinities. And this is what I mean by that. A few years ago, I had an opportunity to do a art show and it was with the Barbican. And part of that was representing a data set I had created in grad school. It was the Pilot Parliament's benchmark. And I made it to be a more inclusive data set than other face data sets had been. So it had parliaments from three African nations and parliaments from three uh, parliamentarians from three European nations. What happened was when they wanted to reproduce that data set, because GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, had been passed, the European lawmakers were protected, but the African ones weren't. And I didn't want only the African faces to be displayed. And so what they decided to do was to see if they could create generative uh, AI faces, right? So at that point, it was using GANs. Uh, and now we have other methods of doing so. And the faces that came out did not quite look so human. But over time, right, these systems have bec become more realistic. So where you even have Tom Hanks, you know, doing a public service announcement <laughs> to say what you're seeing is not actually me. And so the notions of what consent looks like, but also who has agency, right, to decide how my likeness is to be used. And I think about so many creatives who are rightfully afraid, you know, of saying, what does my livelihood look like? So I think it is our responsibility, particularly as developers of AI, as people who shape how AI is being uh, created in the world to say, what are our values and how are we valuing what is human? How are we valuing creativity? So we have a society that still has artists. We have a society that still has authors. I was realizing so many of my newer professions that I've had an opportunity to try are endangered. With Olay, I got to be a model for a little bit. Not an AI model, a human model, model model, right? And in that process, you now have some companies that will create synthetic humans to increase their representation on the diversity side, but they're not actually addressing that economic 
piece of it is not just putting diverse faces, but also distributing, right, the funds in a way that more people um, are benefiting. So I think we really have to ask ourselves, what values do we want to show with the ways in which we're creating the systems? Authors. Again, I wasn't even thinking about authors for a while. Then I recorded my first audiobook and I met a Grammy nominated voice actor. She had done 500 audiobooks and you could tell because of just the way she would interact and help me along. And I had devalued that skill set so much because I didn't have proximity uh, to it. And so I think if we don't wanna be in the last age of experts or expertise or mastery, we really have to address this notion of an apprentice gap. So what happens when the entry level jobs that would have been on ramps or the entry level experiences that would have been on ramps to greater mastery are automated away? What should we do about it? I agree with you by the way, but what should we do? I think part of what we should do is actually set aside funding and pathways that support human creativity. I think the easiest thing to do is to say, what's the cheapest option and automate away humans. So I think being intentional about keeping humans in certain jobs is important. I'll give you one concrete example of this. There was a nonprofit that was doing a call center and it was a call center around eating disorders. Some of the employees demanded that they wanted to have better health care, something of that nature, right? And so management decided to fire them all and replace them with the chat bot to do the automation, to automate the call center. Unfortunately, what happened was the chat bot was actually providing advice that's known to make eating disorders worse. And so this is what I'm saying that we need to be really careful yes. with preserving the human element when there's so much excitement and hype. And I, some of that hype is based on real productivity gains. Don't get me wrong there. But there's also a piece of it where there's the assumption that a model that did well in one case is going to be adapted to another area. And I'm sure with the work that you do, you see the sort of context collapse happen often. So I, I do think that would be something important to continue to do. Well, and I think what you've teased apart is actually two different issues we need to address, right? One is what you said, which is that the, the model that actually doesn't work. In fact, it's, it's counterproductive and it's not helping these patients who need help. It's actually making their eating disorder worse. The second one is that the model is really good, and it's so good that if you're just starting out as a counselor, that you don't ever have a chance to apprentice and make mistakes and get better because the company will just use the AI because until you're an expert, you're not really competitive with the AI itself. And, and that's something that I think you're right. Like there's got to be a way to address that. Otherwise, we'll, en we'll end up stuck with the, the current experts that we have today, and nobody new will ever be given a chance to get, get good at something. And those people will die. So we can't end up in this world of the last experts yeah, and right. the last masters. No, we can't. That's not a, a world that any of us want to live in. So you have a new book coming out today, Unmasking AI. Tell us what, what are the key takeaways, stories, insights from it that you want to share? Well, I'm so excited for everybody to have an opportunity to read this book. The reason I wrote it is there was so much hype around AI and also a lot of fear and doom. And I wanted to go between fear and fascination and really say this is a conversation for everybody. If you have a face, you have a place in this conversation. So here's how AI works. Here's how it can be harmful, but also stories of courage and stories of hope. Here are organizations, here are people who have made positive changes so that we can have beneficial AI that is actually equitable and accountable. And so it is a bit of a behind the scenes look at what it was like to be a graduate student at MIT and then have these experiences of 
here I am at Davos and there's snipers on the roof. I didn't think this would be a place I would be in. And um, what it looks like to work with an organization like Olay and do a whole campaign and end up in Vogue <laughs> right before finishing up a PhD. So How neat. I hope it also gives people a nice behind the scenes of so many of the various opportunities I've been so fortunate uh, to have. But overall, it's a book of uh, hope and encouragement that we can actually build AI that works well for everybody. What did you do with Olay? So with Olay, I was part of the Decode the Bias campaign, and it had several components. So there was a big commercial ad campaign, which a lot of people saw. Some of it was on TV, and some of it was in magazines. So Cosmopolitan, Allure, Harper's Bazaar, and even September Vogue. So for me as a computer scientist, this was not on the career path. Another piece of that campaign was actually doing an algorithmic audit and testing their skin advisor tool. And Procter & Gamble, they even went as far as agreeing to a consented data promise, right? So showing it is possible to build ethical and consented consumer AI tools. So I was really excited to work with them in 2021. We might have some other things in the pipeline uh, coming up. But I think it's great when you have examples to show that change is possible. And also when you have companies that before their regulations, which we need, and before their laws, which we need, actively take the step of having an algorithmic bias. I told the team, based on everything you're telling me about how you develop these systems, I think we'll find bias. And we did. And even knowing that, they agreed to have the algorithmic audit done and to allow us to post those results. So that was not something uh, we see so often, particularly at the time frame uh, they were doing it. So that was Decode the Bias. And an opportunity for, for courageous leadership, right? To For companies to be vulnerable, to be transparent, um, to go in expecting that there's going to be bias and, and commit to, to fixing it. Absolutely. Now, where, where did you grow up? Where are you from? I'm a little bit of a global nomad. So I was born in Canada. Then I moved to Ghana when I was about two years old. Okay. So my first language is Chi. And then I moved to my first Oxford, which was Oxford, Mississippi, when I was oh. around four. And then I think as we were talking a little bit earlier, we both have a second Oxford uh, connection um, over in the UK. That's that's awesome. How do you think those early I mean I'm an immigrant too. How do you think those earlier experiences, you know, shaped the the amazing creative things that you've done? Well, my mother is an artist and my dad's a scientist. So I literally grew up with those worlds in companionship. So I don't think it's too surprising that I'm a poet of code. And I was so encouraged from an early age to both explore my creativity and also pursue science. So I remember going to my dad's lab and he would let me feed cancer cells. He was even uh, using neural networks at that time to explore a uh, computer aided drug discovery. And so when you look Amazing. at the progression of AI and you think about advances like AlphaFold, I remember going and seeing what DeepMind had put out and being reminded of my childhood and seeing those protein folding uh, structures that were on my dad's huge silicon uh, graphics machine then. So that those worlds have been a part of my upbringing uh, from the very beginning. So that not science versus creativity, but science and creativity and how what, what kind of magic and insightful uh, new inventions that that can yield. Absolutely. You know, a lot of our audience members, they have kids and they're wondering how should we educate kids to be successful, responsible, ethical in this era of AI that they're, they're now all growing up in? I love this question, and part of it is when I was a graduate student at MIT Media Lab, though I was with the Center for Civic Media, I also did a lot of work with the Lifelong Kindergarten Group, and they're uh, behind you know projects like Scratch Foundation that encourages kids with oh, block programming languages. Yeah. yeah, so 
so that that whole world and i've been so fortunate to be in many conversations with mitch resnick thinking about what it looks like to create educational approaches and systems that actually foster creativity collaboration and empathy and i think all of those are important and not something that can be easily automated away. We are talking about uh, AI tutors and AI instructors, and yes, they're good for helping solve close-ended problems, but many of the challenges we're going to have to face and our kids are gonna have to face are gonna be filled with so much uncertainty that we wanna develop educational pathways that encourage that creative problem-solving ability and that interest-based learning, which is modeled with the Scratch platform and so forth. And I think we see this with many different iterations of new technologies where there's an excitement to apply it to education, but in ways that don't actually expand possibilities, but constrain them. So, so far we've talked a lot about the, the risks of AI, the inherent bias, things that we can do about it. What do you think are the most promising applications of AI as we look out the next five or 10 years? I'm really excited about the applications when it comes to healthcare and thinking about medical breakthroughs and not even just breakthroughs with therapeutics, but can there be breakthroughs with the cost of certain types of drugs, right? So you might think of biologics, it can cost $25,000 for just one injection, making that sort of therapy not quite available uh, for everybody. So thinking of ways to drive down cost as well as coming up with new therapies is something I'm really excited about, but it has to be done cautiously because there's so much we can learn from with uh, medical apartheid or just very constrained data sets. An example is heart disease, cardiovascular vascular disease. One in three women in the U.S. die of heart disease, but we're less than a quarter of research participants. If I think of data sets around heart disease having more images of people with testosterone versus those with estrogen, that actually changes the way plaque builds up in the arteries, and you want to be able to distinguish that. So I think I'm excited about it, and to do it well, we have to be very cognizant about the differences uh, between us so that these systems can actually develop uh, therapies and therapeutics and approaches that do benefit the majority of humanity. There's so many changes happening all at once, and you've got a lot of different projects going on at once. How do you make the time to stay current and embrace lifelong learning? Oh, I think my team is great at this because they're always sending new articles or something that's going on. I was just at the Grace Hopper conference oh, uh, in one. Orlando, right? You know, and so Anita B and being in these intergenerational spaces, I think helps to give perspective both on, oh, it might actually need to be designed in a different way if you think of folks with various abilities you might not necessarily see in your day-to-day -day or in your peer group. So I think the best thing to do for that lifelong learning is to surround yourself with people in different stages of life and to be reminded of some things, right? Or to be introduced to something completely new. Thank you so much, Joy. Just incredible insights, incredible um, life story. And what a you're a Renaissance woman, just you're a poet, you're an artist, you're a computer scientist, you're an advocate, and thank you so much for, for spending the time with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Really do appreciate it. Some takeaways for me. One, AI is biased because there's biased data, and in some cases, lack of representative data in the data sets used to train AI models. Number two, beyond unintended bias due to lack of representative data sets, there is hate speech on the internet that is part of the training set of today's large language models that we have to address. Number three is that an action that every leader can take now is to conduct what's called an algorithmic audit to look at how your AI is functioning today for your products and services. That's all for this week on the Ask More of AI podcast. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts and follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. To learn more about Salesforce AI, join our Ask More of AI newsletter on LinkedIn. See you next time.